Okay, case nine. Uh, now we have a 40-year-old female with a finger mass. And even without the history, you can figure that this is probably from an acral site. When you have a circumscribed nodule that's kind of popped out without much tissue around it, maybe a little fat, maybe a little dense regular connective tissue like tendon or, or tendon sheath, like we're seeing a little probably bit of here. And then right next to that nodule, if you, if you see that, a nodule that's popped out with not much around it, usually it means you're from the subcutis. Um, and on top of that, if you end up seeing these structures here, which are one of my favorite structures, uh, probably my favorite normal structure in the body, Pacinian corpuscle, there's a deep kind of pressure and vibration sensors uh, that are most abundant on the ventral surfaces of the distal extremity, particularly like in the wrist and the hands and fingers. So this was from the finger in this case, but those beautiful little onions there are Pacinian corpuscles. You could occasionally see them in other sites, but that's the most common place. And then here, look at that. We've got eccrine sweat ducts or glands or eccrine coils. So in the uh, acral sites, the palms or soles, um, you tend to see, uh, you'll see a deep nodule that's down at the level of almost the tendon sheath. And at the same time, you can see skin structures because there's not very much space there between the epidermis. And, you know, the, the epidermis to the bone is only, you know, maybe a centimeter or so in some areas on uh, acral sites. So you'll see these, these skin structures like the eccrine coils, and then you'll also see a nodule that's, you know, maybe attached to the, the tendon sheath or something like that. So that's a good clue when you see Pacini and corpuscles to think of acral sites. When you see a nodule that looks like it's subcutis or even coming off of tendon or fascia, and then it's got eccrine coils or eccrine sweat glands, whatever name you like, that's a good thing to think of uh, the fact that you're probably coming from acral or, or a site nearby. All right. We have this nodule. It's arising. You can just barely see a little bit of tendon sheath here, but it's coming off the tendon sheath or off the fascia. Sometimes in the hands, all those dense regular connective tissue can get kind of blend together. I don't really always know how to tell them apart unless the surgeon tells me what they are. And here we've got a tumor with a lot of different stuff going on. We got a circumscribed nodule, very sharply circumscribed. We have areas with kind of dense collagen with kind of a cracking artifact in this case. We've got abundant foamy histiocytes or xanthoma cells, whichever name you like. And you can see they're foamy because they have little clear, that's a little hard to show on the scope here. But if you look, foamy cells actually have little tiny clear vacuoles in them. That's how you can tell them apart from granular. You should see little tiny clear bubbles that are filled with lipid, very tiny. And they will sometimes indent the nucleus of the cell um, it's hard to tell, tell that here. They don't always do that, but you look for little tiny vacuoles and bubbles that are clear, uh, filling the cytoplasm. That's what you want to see for foamy histiocytes. So we got foamy histiocytes, sclerotic collagen. Oh, we also got some hemosiderin deposition here, some, some pigment that's chunky and golden. And when I flip the condenser, you can see it's very refractile. So that's characteristic of hemosiderin. Look at these cells right here. So these cells have this uh, large kind of pale nucleus with a large nucleolus and then abundant eosinophilic kind of dense cytoplasm, kind of pink to gray or maybe purple even here, a little amphiphilic if you like. And this one has a little ring of hemosiderin around the outside. Can you, I hope you can appreciate that. Maybe I'll flip the condenser to show you. Yeah. See, there's this like kind of little dusty ring of hemosiderin around the outside. And the nucleus is off to the side. It's eccentric. So this is kind of a plasma cytoid, or I kind of almost like to think of them as rhabdoid looking cells. They're like kind of histiocytic looking, but also have an eccentric nucleus. There we go. I bumped the slide. All right. And then look, a couple more of those cells here, each of them having this peripheral ring of hemosiderin. So these are the characteristic cells that you want to see for this tumor. So this is a tenosynovial giant cell tumor. And it could either be giant cell tumor of tendon sheath, which is tenosynovial giant cell tumor localized type, or if, and, and we've seen already from low power, this is a circumscribed localized lesion. So that's certainly what this is going to be. And it's also in the finger, which is a good location for that. But if it were looked like this at high power, but say it was a diffuse infiltrating mass in the knee involving the joint space, then we would say it's tenosynovial giant cell tumor 
comma, diffuse type, also known when it involves the joint space, the synovium, also known as pigmented villonodular synovitis. So I've got a whole video about those two entities going into great detail. I'll put a link below. But um, in any case, it's good to remember that they are ba basically two um, variants uh, of the same tumor, tenosynovial giant cell tumor at high power. They look identical. They have all the features we're talking about here. The difference is one of them is circumscribed and usually smaller, it tends to be more in the distal extremities. And the other one tends to be more diffuse, infiltrative, often involves the synovial space of large joints like the knee and tends to be more uh, locally aggressive and problematic um, for the patient. Even though it's technically benign, it can really cause a lot of morbidity for the patient. So the, the distinction is based on the clinical and radiographic features. If I just have a fragment, I'll call it tenosynovial giant cell tumor. And then in the comment, I'll say it could either be the diffuse or the localized type. It totally depends. You have to correlate radiographically or correlate with the intraoperative findings, something like that. So what I want to see, though, are these, these plasma cytoid histiocytes that have, a, that have an eccentric nucleus. If you're lucky, you'll see this ring of hemosiderum, which I find a very characteristic finding for this tumor. And then look, they often have mitoses, sometimes many mitoses, and they can be very scary to see these large, plump, epithelioid looking cells and then find mitoses everywhere. So you may notice I'm talking about something that's a tenosynovial giant cell tumor or a giant, oh, I forgot to mention, the other name, the localized form of tenosynovial giant cell tumor is also known as giant cell tumor of tendon sheath, which is what this is. So I talked about giant cells, but where are the giant cells? Well, what's important is to remember how to diagnose this with all of the features that are not giant cells, because some cases lack giant cells or the giant cells may be very sparse and very focal and, and hard to find. So in those cases, if you don't recognize all the features we just talked about, then you're going to potentially make a misdiagnosis when you see these big plump cells here and then you start finding mitoses. And if you haven't already thought of giant cell tumor tenon sheath or tenosynovial giant cell tumor, then you can really uh, get, get into some big trouble there and make a mistake and think it's malignant or something. Now, here are some scattered osteoclastic, usually osteoclastic giant cells. That one looks almost like a Teuton giant cell, but they're usually osteoclast form. And they can be abundant or they can be totally absent or sparse and focal, like I just said, and scattered around the tumor. There's another mitosis. Like I said, sometimes the mitotic rate is quite high, very scary. And they tend to have this very dense background collagen that's so sclerotic, looks almost like osteoid. Um, sometimes they can calcify. Um, I, I have not encountered that very frequently, but some of my bone and soft tissue colleagues tell me they see that regularly. Um, and there again is the characteristic, the, the neoplastic cell, these plasmacytoid histiocytes. There they are. Sometimes they're binucleated and um, when they have that ring of hemocytorin, I like to say they have a halo like an angel, like a halo of hemocytorin, but I believe that some others have called them ladybird cells, like, uh, which is like the British word for ladybug, I believe, which is, uh, if you haven't seen one of those, you can go Google it. There, I guess that's kind of like a ladybird cell. Looks like a little ladybug because it's got like one of those two little round fake eyes that they have on top. Okay. And then the foamy histiocytes I find quite helpful. Uh, it's not always present, but um, I'd say in a significant subset of cases, um, you will have, maybe even a majority of cases, you'll have some area of foamy histiocytes, although it may be focal. It tends to be more around the periphery of the tumor, like kind of a zone out at the edge. So go look at around the outside. I find it really helpful to find the, hit, the, um, the foamy histiocytes. And then also hemocytorin usually present at least focally. So you may have to hunt around for those things, but it can really help you out if you're having a tough case and uh, not sure of the diagnosis. And also, uh, sometimes you'll get little pools of discohesive tumor cells where they're all kind of falling apart. Not seeing that so much in this one. This one looks actually very, very sclerotic. And maybe it's been around longer, hard to say, but I kind of wonder if it's been sitting here kind of sclerosing over time. But that's just me uh, using my imagination. I can't prove it. But if you want to see some of those other features, like I said, go check out the video down below and it'll show you some of the other variations on this theme. Uh, these are relatively common and because they can be mitotically active and can have few or no giant cells, it's really important for pathologists to be aware of these. Um, they also tend to be uh, sometimes are pet avid. They can be hot on a PET scan because they're mitotically active. So I've seen these before incidentally discovered, both, both uh, the diffuse and the localized type, I've seen them discovered incidentally on a PET scan or a PET CT in a cancer patient who was getting worked up with PET CT. And then they found this, uh, this, uh, this hot nodule on PET. And then on biopsy, you see these big epithelioid looking plasma cytoid cells and you see mitoses. And I've seen a case like that on frozen section where 
it was really tempting. They said the patient has a history of cancer and this is a pet hot nodule and these cells look large and then there's mites. And then I saw some hemocytorin and then I saw some foam cells and I was like, ooh, wait, uh, I think this is actually tenosynovial giant cell tumor. Let's defer to permanent. And sure enough, that's what it was. But it was really tempting with that, all those history points there to make me think, you know, maybe it's metastatic carcinoma and, it, um, and there were no giant cells on the biopsy on that one. On the excision, there were a few. So in any case, it's an important thing to keep in mind um, and uh, to remember, and that was something that Mark Edgar, one of my awesome soft tissue mentors, told me that, that some cases can be pet avid. And I'm so thankful he told me that because when I encountered one in practice, I was able to thankfully not mistake that for malignancy at the time of frozen section. So hopefully that pearl will help save some of you in practice. And again, spend time studying. Don't just stop at the giant cells. When the giant cells are present, it's easy. But spend time learning all the other features. So next time you see one of these, go look around. See if you can find one of these little cells with a halo of hemocytorin. They're not always there, but oftentimes you'll find them. And they're very satisfying and, and very pretty to look at, I think, too, to my eye. So uh, go and hunt around and explore the background and learn all the subtleties of this tumor um, so that you can recognize it when it's not classic uh, microscopically.